Okay, we're gonna start letting people in at 12 o'clock. Okay, Gabe. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're just going to get started at the moment. Um, okay, so I want to thank everybody for being here. And I just like to say that this webinar is being live streamed. So if you would like to, if you'd like to be unidentifiable, maybe just change your name, um, although all cameras remain um, closed. Um, okay, if we can just get right into it. So I'm, my name is Rondeka Mkwaba and I work at Democracy International. I work mainly on the International Democracy Community, which is a project that aims to create a platform for networking and learning opportunities for people that work on direct democracy and civic participation. Um, it's also a platform where people that are interested in the topic can gain knowledge and sort of join the conversation. Um, so this webinar series, um, it came about because when I arrived at Democracy International, I was completely not really sure what direct democracy is and I, I'd say right now I'm still learning as well but whenever I speak to people in my life it's always a very hard conversation about understanding what exactly direct democracy is so I thought um, making a direct democracy simplified webinar series would be a great opportunity for our community and for us as Democracy International to inform people on direct democracy and the instruments that are available to them or the lack thereof maybe. So in this webinar, we will examine the feasibility and the implications of employing direct democracy at a, on a transnational scale. Um, we will delve into principles, potential benefits and limitations of direct democracy and citizen participation in, this, in the context of cross-border decision making. Um, and I'm now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the structure that I sort of came up with for the webinar. So really, it is about having it as simple as possible for anybody to understand what it is. So I thought let's start with basic theoretical descriptions of what transnationality is and answering the question of whether or not direct democracy instruments can be used on this on, on a transnational level. Um, this will be done by Caroline Bernain. And then our second uh, panelist will be Daniela um, Vanchish, and she will be speaking about an example that currently exists on the European level. This is a citizen, this is a European citizen, citizens initiative. And she'll also introduce what is a proposal currently right now that um, has potential to take um, place on the global level. Um, and then we'll have our third speaker go into transnationality in action. So John Steva will take us through a global citizen. Global Citizens Assembly, which is a campaign that's already taken place, and it was around climate change. And he's going to give us a, a more in-depth description of how it worked, what worked, what didn't. And then at the end of all of this, we'll follow with the Q&A session um, where we get to open up the floor for questions, um, which will mainly be in the chat. So feel free to, to put your questions in the chat. Our team will be monitoring them as we go. And so as an introduction, I thought it was important to get some groundwork with the basics of um, the theory of transnationality, what institutions exist on this level, and most importantly, what democratic inst instrument, instruments exist on the level. To take us through this, Caroline Bernain, our global program manager here at Democracy International, she mainly works on building alliances, raising awareness and managing campaigns aim aimed at creating democratic infrastructure for citizens, to take part in decision making on a global level, as well as organizing key events such as our World Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy, which is currently the biggest forum on, on direct democracy. Um, so Caroline, please can I hand over to you? I think you are able to share your screen and we will hear from Caroline. Thank you so much, Landeka. Um, I hope you're all hearing me well, and I'm going to try and share my screen indeed. So. I hope everyone can see that. Uh, I can't see it. Wait. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, yeah. So we have a, um, a, a, a direct democracy simplified uh, webinar today under the title of transnationality, and it is sort of a 
monstrous uh, term that I now have the, uh, the terrible job of trying to simplify. What is transnationality? Um, so I'm going to do my best. Uh, and of course, afterwards, we, there will also be time for questions. Um, transnationality is a super, it's a super broad concept. So I definitely won't be able to, to cover everything. Um, but the idea of this webinar is to go through the basics, right? Um, so yeah, when we talk about transnationality, transnational or what? Um, we talk about anything that is extended beyond national boundaries. Um, so since let's say there is some discussion about this, but just for the little history lesson, like since the, the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, um, that brought peace to Europe. So Europe had been at war for decades, right? Uh, different um, kingdoms and, and principalities just fighting each other. Um, and in the Treaty of Westphalia, it defined sort of borders for the first time, like this is your space and this is my space. Um, and we will, um, I will recognize that you're a sovereign in, in your country and I'm a sovereign in my country. And that is basically the invention of the modern nation state. Um, so that is something that is relatively new. Um, but in, um, so, so 400 years old, and in those 400 years, the, the nation state or countries have really become the basis of, of like how we do politics, right? Um, so it is the main arena for, for where we make decisions um, on, on what is going to happen to our lives, right? So, so in a lot of countries, um, less and less these days, unfortunately, but in most countries, you can vote for a parliament where you will be represented and where people um, will make laws in, in your name that then um, sort of govern, govern your life. Um, but there are, of course, issues or there are times where it's not enough to, um, to make decisions in the framework of, this, of these nation states. Um, and in that case, we, uh, we need transnationality. So uh, then we uh, are talking about transnationality. Um, so yeah, when we talk about transnationality, and there are many, many different kinds about that, but we usually talk about um, a setting in which we make shared policies that address the interests of multiple states or multiple political entities. Um, so that means that, that we make decisions together, that, that decisions are made sort of in a collaborative way. Um, something else that's difficult, that's interesting to note, it, policies is not the same as politics. It's not a party running uh, for running for office, trying to get your, your vote. Um, it is deciding on a course of action to address a specific issue together. Um, interests is another key word in this phrase, right? Like who is benefited by this um, and, and why does it need to take place on a, not on a national level, but on a, on a different level altogether. Um, and Yes, um, so it says there are multiple states, but actually it doesn't have to be states, it could also be cities um, or, or other political um, actors. Um, the, the key part here is that it, tra that it passes across national borders. Yeah, and so why do we do that? Um, this, why do we have something that like transnational transnationality? Why have we set up all of these very complicated structures. Um, it's because we've realized that we have common problems, right? That cross borders, like we have climate change. Um, we've all spent uh, two years working from home um, or from or studying from home or not meeting our families because of a pandemic um, that obviously doesn't care about borders. Um, conflicts uh, are often between nation states and therefore, you know, um, are above the nation state level economic crises like the 2008 financial crisis like had effects all over the world. Um, so these, so states at some point recognize that there are simply problems that are too big for them and that they need to tackle in a different, on a different level. Um, some transnational organizations or, or multilateral organizations um, are just there to foster cooperation between nation states. Um, so it's just to work together better, to coordinate policies, to make sure that, you know, because countries realize that they are too small to do something by themselves. Me, I come from Belgium. <laughs> we are a tiny country where we are very, very aware of the fact that there's, there's not much we can do together. So we try to make alliances with different countries and we have that in different settings um, to be more effective, right? On the global stage. Um, 
yeah, and to prevent wars um, between uh, nation states. Um, and then finally, sort of a third cluster of, of, of a reason of being um, for these transnational organizations is um, to ensure justice and human rights. So we have decided 75 years ago this year that human rights are universal values and that every single human being on this planet has them. They're inalienable um, and we need institutions to, um, to protect those human rights. Uh, we need um, institutions where people can turn to in case their human rights are being violated. Um, right, so that brings us to, that all sounds great, right? We should have more of that. <laughs> um, so what do we already have actually? Um, I'm, so we have very simple ones. I, I, I just, we have many, 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 many different transnational organizations and I'm not going to present all, all of them, but I want to present some of them just to give you an idea of like what different kinds are out there. So for example, there are very simple ones like the Mekong River Commission, um, is a commission of cities along the Mekong River in Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand. Um, and they are just there to make sure that the water quality is good, um, that there is no conflict around uh, the availability of water, um, and to sort of coordinate action on that. That's a very simple one. Um, then you have, you know, a little more complicated ones, such as the World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization um, was established to to, um, to foster economic cooperation and financial cooperation between countries because um, we decided that, that free trade um, is, is something that, that we want between countries and that, 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 makes, um, that, that helps people. So therefore, we set up a World Trade Organization. And of course, we can debate whether or not the WTO actually does that. Um, but we, um, we set up the World Trade Organization to coordinate policies around um, taxes between different countries, for example. That is also a relatively easy one. Okay, let's try and do a more difficult one. Um, there's the, you have regional um, transnational organizations. So not every transnational organization is completely global or completely local. You have, for example, the African Union, but you also have the Organization of American States. Um, it does a little more already because it also guarantees like human rights for um, for people in the in its member states. It has a it has human rights court. Um, it coordinates policies. It co um, it, it, it it mediates between uh, between members. And it it um, for example it monitors elections, so it makes sure that that democracy is guaranteed in the, in in the Americas. Um, okay, then let's try. A little more complicated still. So uh, the European Union was founded. Um, so I, I said, but I lied to you actually that uh, the Treaty of Westphalia um, brought peace to Europe. It did. It worked for a little while, but uh, not for very long. Um, like Europe as a as a continent has of course been war ridden for a, for a very long time, and um, especially the two world wars absolutely devastated it. And um, what we noticed in Europe is that what often happened is that, you know, one or two of our member states, which shall not be named, um, like to fight each other and then um, <laughs> drag, drag, the rest of the, drag the rest of the world along with them. So the European Union was founded to coordinate policies, economic policies. So it was very simple. It was about coal and steel in the beginning because the reasoning was if, our coal and steel trade, so the basis of our weapons manufacturing industry, if that is linked to each other, then countries can't go to war to each other. I won't sell you steel if you're going to fight me with it, right? Um, so that was the initial idea of the European Union. It started as a union of coal and steel. But then over the years, um, the European Union um, grew and, and, and um, you know, um, sort of donate, gave itself or member, the members of the Euro European Union um, saw the value of, of adding more, um, more functions to it, right? So now the European Union also has climate change policy. Um, it, it, there's a European Central Bank that governs uh, the, the Euro. There's a, there's a monetary union, right? So um, there are a lot of, not all member states, but a lot of member states of the EU have a common currency, the Euro. Um, there's a European Court of Human Rights where um, I can go and um, file a complaint if um, my human rights have been violated in my member state. Um, so, so the European Union is, is, is a transnational organization that has grown over time. 
Okay, I'm bringing you to the to the last one, um, the UN. So I think everybody has heard about the UN, the United Nations. Um, it is, I think, I would say the closest thing we have to a world government government. Um, with the the small or the big difference that, of course, there is no government at the UN. The UN. Um, we don't have ministers or we don't have a president of the UN. We have a secretary general and then we have a, the general assembly, which is um, sort of, um, which you could regard as a parliament, a world parliament, except that of course the people at the general assembly are not elected by us directly, right? You don't get to vote for them. You vote for your national government, your national government appoints a parliament. Well, you vote for your national parliament that appoints a government that appoints a minister of foreign affairs and the minister of foreign affairs will appoint somebody to sit in a general assembly so you only very indirectly have a say in the UN. Um, yeah but so what does the UN do? Oh well lots of stuff. Um, so um, right so so the UN it, it does everything right um, so yeah in the pandemic uh, the World Health Organization was instrumental in, in sort of coordinating policies across countries. Um, there's a, the UN Development Program, which, which tries to help uh, economic development and, and human development across the planet and sort of lift people out of poverty. There's uh, the International Criminal Court in The Hague, which you've certainly heard of, where, um, uh, where, where yes, abuses of human rights can be prosecuted and, and, and are tried. Um, there's the International Labour Organization, which regulates labour standards uh, across the world. There's UNESCO, which deals with culture. Um, and then there's even very things that you might never have thought of, but like uh, WIPO, which deals, deals with intellectual property standards across borders. Or you have the International Aviation Authority, which, deal, which makes sure that planes can fly from one country to the next under standardized regulations, right? Um, because if the rules would be different in Sweden than they are to, um, to Egypt, then that would actually be dangerous. So, so all of these agencies and all of these um, subsections of the UN have their own sort of um, dedicated function. Um, right, and so why do we have these? Um, because we decided that we needed them because um, so, yes, yeah, so, some problems cannot be dealt with on the local level. And so that brings us to sort of my two closing words that I want to say here. Um, two elements are super important when we think about transnational decision making and um, and like let that word fade fade away like trans transnational decision making basically just means like anything um, that we do, that crosses beyond, you know, you're voting for your national parliament. Um, and so one important element, and I think that's also um, what, what we hear a lot um, in the, when it comes to the European Union, for example, is, is the element of, of subsidiarity. It's an, an awful, another awful word, um, which means that the power or government, uh, the power of the government ought to reside at the lowest feasible level or in human terms, um, we make decisions at the level where it fits. Um, so, for example, if we're going to talk about the road in front of my office, it, it, it does not make sense to do that on the national level, and it definitely does not make sense to have the UN rule about it. Um, that's something that the city council does, right, here in Cologne. Um, if we talk about climate change, then it might make sense that we do it at the international level. Um, but of course, if we talk about climate change, it could also mean that we are talking about planting more trees in the city. And so you see how this is, it is a waterfall of um, where decisions are made. And it is a, a, a very important guiding principle that the lowest possible level where decision can be made is where decision should be made um, because it's the closest to the citizen. So, and that brings us to my final, um, my final term for today is representation, right? Because all of these bodies um, on the transnational level, or most of them, with one exception, uh, rep reside on the principle of representation. So that you are represented by somebody who makes decisions for you. So in the best case, and that is really in the best case because only a minority of countries on the world today are democracies where you can vote. Um, in the best case, I vote for a parliament, and that parliament 
assembles a government and that government appoints somebody who will represent me in one of these um, transnational institutions. And that person should speak for me, right? Um, and so our question today deals with like, how can we go beyond that? We have, we live in an, in an age of, of technological possibilities that were unimaginable 20 years ago. So how does that influence this? Um, we have countries that, that where people don't have the possibility to, to be represented on the national level. So let alone on the international level, how do we deal with that? Um, and yeah, and, and maybe mainly the question like, are some policies too abstract, too far from the citizens to be dealt with by citizens themselves? And so I would already argue that that is not the case. Um, and then I will hand it over to, um, to Daniela, who has some actual um, examples of, um, of transnational democracy in action around the world already um, today. And so thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. But uh, before we move on, um, after telling us about all these transnational institutions that exist, um, I'm just, what would you say are the current state of transnational institutions in relation to accountability and democracy is like as it stands at the moment? Yeah, so as I, as I said, like only in the only in all of these institutions, um, with maybe the exception of the European Union, where people vote directly for um, for representatives in the parliament, right? So um, you, you have European level elections. Um, but all of the other ones are basically based on member state representation. So um, what is represented there is, is the agglomerated interest of all citizens in a member state um, and mostly the majority, right? So, because in most, in a functioning democracy, I would vote for a parliament in the parliament, parties would have to build a coalition, they would have to get, you know, 50% of the seats, and then they would make the rules for that country for the next four or five or six years, usually. Um, and I might not, I might happen to belong to the 40% of citizens that don't agree with this policy, but I'm not, I'm not shown anywhere in the system, right? Nobody is taking my interests to the global level. Um, and so this is, um, I think a, a major flaw that we have right now. It's it's a it's a huge filter, and we've seen it work. For example, I think the the most clear example is climate change, um, where there are, you know, there is a I think there is a a big coalition of citizens around the world who believe that there should be action on climate change, um, but there are very few governments who are taking that action or who are willing to push that action forward on the global level. Um, so. That I think that is the most flagrant existence of. Not that there are no exceptions, there definitely are. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Um, and now that we have a solid understanding of what transnationality is and how democratic these all these institutions that we just heard heard about are, I would like to um, get into an example of this. So we on the European level, we have a Europe, something that's called the European Citizens Initiative. And um, the European Citizens Initiative, which is usually called the ECI, um, is a European Union mechanism aimed at increasing um, direct democracy and enabling EU citizens to participate directly in the development of EU policies introduced with the Treaty of, the, of, of Lisbon in, 20, in 2007. So Daniela is going to speak to us about that and just like a fun fact about Democracy International. So the, our founding fathers actually were part of the lobbying towards the ECI back, back when it was just an idea and Democracy International was formed and now we work as a partner of the ECI uh, mainly with lobbying and we also part of the ECI forum. Um, so she'll be telling us a bit about the European Citizens Initiatives um, um, and just like specifications about that and how that works and what that kind of looks like on a real level. And then she'll also go on to tell us about something that's called the World Citizens Initiative, which forms part of um, a campaign called the We the People's Campaign, which is still a proposal level right now. But this idea is sort of to de de democratize the, the, the UN. Um, so Daniela, uh, Daniela is our European manager at Democracy International and she's our ECI expert. So we're gonna hear everything ECI related from her. Thank you, Daniela. Thanks a lot, uh, Lenica. Uh, I'm really happy to join this session on transnationality 
because I get another chance to talk about my favorite democratic tool, and that's the European Citizens Initiative. So I'm going to share my screen right now. Just give me a quick heads up that, that you can see that. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so this is a, this is the direct marketing 101, but we're going to look into a little bit of specifications of how uh, the real life uh, transnational direct democracy tools can work. And we have uh, one concrete example for that, and that's the European Citizens Initiative. It's till now the, the world's only and first transnational tool of well, I say near direct democracy because it's not necessarily binding. It's uh, it's it's an agenda setting instrument, but we're going to get into that in, in just a second. But uh, as far as speaking about near direct democracy and at least giving citizens the opportunity to put a proposal on the table and really get into dialogue with decision makers, the ECI is the example that we have at transnational level, and uh, it could be already an ex uh, an inspiration for for the global level with our campaign for the the World Citizens Initiative. So a little bit of background about what the ECI is in case um, in case you don't know. Um, there's some civil society background in the ECI. So that's definitely the history of Democracy International. It's really rooted in, in the ECI. So about 20 years ago when the ECI was just, uh, just an idea, it was really the founding members of Democracy International that was at the, the Convention on the Future of Europe uh, in 2002 that was lobbying for an idea like the ECI to make it uh, to make it into the Lisbon Treaty. And it was very inspired by uh, the direct democracy tools uh, of, Swiss, of Switzerland, uh, really citizens initiative and bottom up um, instruments. And you can see some of the photos here. These are from the from the time when they were collecting signatures at the convention and really lobbying for the for the ECI to make its way in. Um, the, Democracy International was not an established organization at the time, but it was the founding members of Democracy International, along with 110 other NGOs there, and uh, a number of, of MEPs that uh, were supporting this proposal. Um, it made it in, so that's a spoiler alert. We do have the ECI today, uh, and that's an Article uh, 11, Article 24, and then the regulation is something that has seen an update already uh, in, the, in, in 2020, we see now the new, we call the rules of the game of the ECI. And that's how, um, how ECIs are run, the real specifications of how to run uh, an ECI. And I'm gonna go over that uh, right now uh, because I think that is really going to be the basis for us. If we're thinking about, we want to have a tool like this at global level for the UN, we need to look at the ECI because it's the only comparable instrument that we could have uh, that is going to uh, to allow us to understand how we can get something like this from the European level to scale it up to to the global level. So uh, ECI is one, two, three. Really, it should be six because there's about six uh, official steps that you need to launch an ECI. So first things first, you're going to need um, seven citizens. So you and six other EU citizen friends from seven different um, EU member states that can launch an, an, an ECI. And this can be on anything that the EU has competencies to act on that does change the EU treaties. And of course, that is um, not, um, not against EU values, that's following human rights um, and so on. And so uh, if you can pass that first verification stage, then you go on to the, to the next one and that's already the, the signature collection stage. In the ECI, we need 1 million signatures within one year um, to, to be able to be considered a successful initiative. And there's a threshold in seven member states. So not all 1 million signatures can come from Germany. This has to be a really European transnational tool. So there's a, a threshold in, in seven member states for that. There's a possibility to collect signatures online as well as, as offline, um, making this tool also a, a, a direct digital um, a tool. Uh, and for that, we have the central, Europe, uh, central online collection system that the European Commission provides free of charge with 24 hour uh, help desk. Uh, it's worked very well. And uh, we also have the ECI forum where Democracy International is also supporting the, the content of the forum, offering advice to, to organizers uh, and we're, I mean, it's really a help desk for, for ECI organizers. If you're thinking about launching an ECI, if you uh, want to get background information or learning materials or guidance materials on ECIs, learn the success stories, how to make it uh, to, to 1 million signatures, that's the place that you're going to want to be. Uh, and then what happens if you make it to, to 1 million signatures? Well, then there's going to be a signature verification uh, stage, and that happens at the member state level because their member states are, of course, the ones who are going to have the data of the of um, those signatories. They have three months uh, to do that, 
And then uh, once that's finalized and the, the seven member states, at least seven minimum seven, seven member states have issued that the signatures are indeed verified, usually that's done by, by a random sample, uh, then the political response uh, can, can begin for, uh, for that ECI. What happens first is organizers are going to be invited within one month to the commission uh, to have an exchange. The, the organizers um, can then present their case uh, to, the, to the commission why they think that this particular initiative um, should be taken up by the commission. Uh, the European Parliament, in the meantime, within three months, is also going to have a, a public hearing with the possibility of uh, having a, a public, a public um, resolution, also in a vote on the, uh, on the ECI. Uh, and then uh, within six months of uh, of submitting the, um, the signatures, the commission is going to issue its response. Now, like I said, this is a tool of near direct democracy, so it's not binding. The commission does not have to take up the, the initiative, but uh, it is an invitation to, to the commission is the words we always say. And it is, uh, the ECIs basically can serve as an inspiration for, for future legislation. And that's exactly has been the case for, um, for several initiatives. Now you can see on the right hand, Side here, the, the the seven answers ECIs already. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I can say a little bit about each of them and their level of, of responsiveness from the commission. End of the cage age has been responded to nearly one to one. So really, almost 100% of the the organizers' demands have been taken up by the commission. And then right to water, for example, the very first successful initiative. There's a new EU water uh, directive. And if you're interested in this, you should be following then in, in, uh, in July, we'll have two ECIs that are also going to see responses. So that's going to be stop thinning on a shark trade and safe cruelty-free cosmetics. Uh, and actually safe cruelty-free cosmetics tomorrow is going to be the, the public uh, hearing in the European Parliament. So you can also uh, watch that if you're, you're going to be interested. So they are, these, organ these ECIs are following this exact uh, timeline here. Okay, now um, some specific uh, special benefits that the ECI has, has provided. Uh, that's, uh, I would say it has a huge benefit in digital and youth engagement. So it has a very special digital dimension because first of all, signatures can be collected online. That's not always the case uh, with uh, national petitioning tools that we have or even local petitioning tools. Typically this has also been collected on paper. With the COVID times, this is now changing uh, a bit more in the digital direction, and which is good. Uh, and then, of course, there's also the there's the possibility to to sign with the with the electronic ID. Uh, right now, in 16 member states, they really want to push that. The European Parliament, especially, is pushing that, and across all member states, that would be great because then just with a um, with a face ID or with a fingerprint option in your uh, on your smartphone, you can sign an ECI within seconds. You don't have to fill out the the form that requires all the data. So that's something that um, we really hope to see in the future. Uh, there's also a special youth engagement proponent of the ECI, and now in you can see here Belgium, Germany, Estonia, Malta, Austria, and Greece, you can sign uh, below 18. So all those are 16. Greece, you can sign uh, at age 17. So it's a good way to get young people to sign ECIs. We can't get data on how many young people sign ECIs because it's all encrypted information. Uh, but we have information about the organizers, the age distribution of, of all ECIs. Uh, and you can see here that there is quite uh, interest from young people, at least from age 20 to 21 to 30, that's considered definitely young, and there, um, there's definitely an interest for them to organize ECIs. So we can assume, I think, that uh, also there's an interest in young people to, to sign ECIs, which makes sense. People are connecting uh, closely to, to issues uh, these days much more than, than uh, political parties, for example. So. Uh, so I, there's a really interesting use the engagement proponent to the TCIs there. This is just, uh, I think, uh, interesting to take a look at which countries um, really produce successful ECIs. So I would say if you're looking at launching an ECI, think about um, having Italy and Spain as your target country because they uh, have a pretty good track record with, uh, with successful ECIs. Okay, now a couple of the, the, the shortcomings. First of all is the low public awareness. This was a, um, a uh, we helped fund this, we commissioned a YouGov to, to do a survey in four member states on the level of awareness of, of ECIs. We did this a couple of years ago. And uh, what we found out is that only 2.4% of, of people on average, of EU citizens know what the ECI is. Now there are some Eurobarometer surveys out there that have higher um, percentage, but this was an independently commissioned um, uh, study. So 
in any case, it's low. It is it is low. Even the EU parameter responses are, are, are low. And there is uh, attempts to to combat this. Uh, there is um, public awareness campaigns that the European Commission is really is pushing for. And there's different initiatives like ECI Day, uh, which is going to be now in two weeks. That Democracy to International is also a permanent partner of. Uh, so there are initiatives to to work on this, but um in the end it also it all comes down to we just we also have uh, a lack of a very weak european public sphere as well so eci is just another uh, another tick there another shortcoming that uh, we often criticize is also that the ecis could use stronger political impact and definitely more political visibility but again this this lies in the instrument itself because it is an agenda setting tool it is not a direct democracy tool it is a near direct democracy tool we have ideas how to get that stronger we want this to become a, a direct democracy tool and a, and a right of every eu um, citizen also lead then to trigger eu wide referendum um, but now we're still a couple steps behind there. Okay, now uh, putting this into the global perspective. So um, we really want to look at the ECI as our main uh, comparison for having a world citizens initiative. What we always say, why it's even important to have have something like a world citizens initiative is first of all, the, the, the UN today is facing a lot of the same criticisms that the EU back then, back in the early 2000s at the last uh, convention has faced the democratic deficit. There's no real opportunity for ordinary citizens uh, to take part and to have a voice and decisions are really made uh, top down. This is the same kind of arguments that, that the EU is facing um, uh, 20 years ago. And since then we've seen a lot of steps um, it, definitely in the, right, in the right direction. So what we always say, we say global problems require global so solutions. For that, we also want ci citizens to take part in that and global citizens and people to, to have a say uh, on that. And so what the World Citizens Initiative would do is basically give a voice to ordinary citizens uh, in global politics and that you don't need to be somebody uh, like Greta Thunberg, I would say that can take then the, the democratic uh, global stage, but that also ordinary citizens uh, could basically take part in, in, uh, in helping shape the global uh, agenda. And of course, this is uh, directed towards the, the UN because also, as Caroline mentioned, is our um, only real monitoring and um, uh, body that we have at, at global level. The We the People's campaign, um, as Bruce mentioned uh, by Lundeka, is the, the campaign that we, we have that with uh, Democracy International, with Civicus and Democracy Without Borders, uh, pushing for, for this for a World Citizens Initiative. That's some of the organizations that are, that are on board, plus 200 other uh, civil society organizations. And um, we have now uh, also, in the meantime, commissioned a report on how exactly World Citizens Initiative could look like. So um, I'm going to do a quick little comparison of how the World Citizens Initiative could look like in real life based on the ECI. So we commissioned this report with uh, a couple of years ago with an expert um, on the ECI, James Oregon, and Ben Murphy is an expert on the UN. They came together and they basically um, looked at how a World Citizens Initiative could look like modeled on, on the ECI. So uh, the good news is you don't need to read the entire study. It's definitely possible to, it's definitely feasible to have a World Citizens Initiative. Uh, and uh, there's also articles in the, in the UN Treaty that would, that would allow for this. Uh, and basically how it would look like is first of all, to launch, as I mentioned, seven EU members, uh, CU, uh, seven EU citizens from seven EU member states. What our uh, experts and study suggest is 10 citizens, and that's uh, across this geographical representation. And this comes directly from the Security Council. Uh, uh, representation as well. So we, we also decided to, to follow that. And of the UN uh, would be established, and that could be something called like the, the World um, Citizenship Administrative Board. So um, some new creation in, in the UN would also be then necessary to, to make sure all of the administrative and day-to-day -day, uh, uh, things would also run um, for the World Citizens Initiative. 
Uh, now the big question, of course, is how much support would be needed? Because as we, we know, ECI, 1 million signatures in one year, seven EU member states. Um, we've come to the conclusion in the, in the study that 5 million signatures would be a fair ask across 18 uh, months. And again, with um, with that geographical representability, uh, as we saw in, the, in establishing the citizens uh, committee. And the threshold here would be 0.5% of the population in each of those uh, states. And then to verify the signatures, uh, as we said with the ECI, EU member states do this typically on a random, random with a random sample. For the World Citizens Initiative, there's two uh, opportunities here and two, uh, two possibilities. Uh, one is that each country carries out its own verification. Now, this already you can see where there could be some trouble. I mean, non-democratic states um, is a question then of of credibility and the and uh, if they can really be trusted there. And then the second option is there uh, would be a centralization of the verification of support in a in a UN body. So there are a couple options. Uh, and then uh, coming down to World Citizens Initiative uh, response, what happens if this uh, this 18 uh, months uh, region, we have 5 million signatures reached within 18, 18 months across those states. Uh, of course, it's clear in the, the ECI, it's the European Commission who responds with uh, the European Parliament responses, uh, the public hearings and so on. With the World Citizens Initiative, there's a couple possibilities there that, that we could have. Uh, first, it could be um, a response by the UN Security Council that would have a motion for a re resolution. This would be especially be in cases that have um, uh, everything to do with peace and security, as that's the, that's the body that deals with that. A second option would be then to trigger a special session of the UN General Assembly and here um, heads of state also take part. So it's all about, again, uh, bringing something to the table of the, de the the decision makers and coming closer into dialogue with them. And then a third option is also that it's discussed in um, one of or multiple of the six main committees uh, of the UN. So there are a couple different different options there. And again, this is not uh, meant to be a completely um, a binding instrument that also cannot be the, the case at the at the UN level. We're also not not saying that this is it's going to to uh, answer all of our, our questions in democratizing the UN and, and making transnational democracy a, a reality. But the ECI also doesn't solve all of the EU's democratic problems. It does bring us one step closer to democratizing the EU, and that's uh, exactly what we want to see with the uh, with the UN. So this is just a reminder that we, it was civil society who was pushing for the for the European Citizens Initiative back then. And um, there's civil society support behind the World Citizens Initiative. So I think we're already at a good first few steps here. Yeah, thank you, Daniela. I think um, a lot of people would like, argue or worry that like, this is a lot of signatures that need to be collected. And you know, there's obviously a lot, a lot of work that needs to be done for these um, ideas to actually be, be brought forward. And I'm just wondering like, what do you think the role of like civil society organizations and grassroots movements can be here? Because it's definitely not something that's um, member state related necessarily, but more, I think, civil society organizations. And what role do you think they can play here? Maybe just like in two minutes. Yeah, I can see, um, I think, because we connect so closely to issues. And I think when we think global problems, we think the first thing that comes to my mind is, is Carolina already mentioned is also climate issues. So I think especially a binding together, uh, coming together of the major uh, climate organizations and pushing for an instrument like this what could be a first step uh, and having like Greenpeace and so on. These are already some of the organizations that are uh, endorsing the campaign for a World Citizens Initiative. And it's really just about having that platform. So it's it was also a variety of democracy organizations uh, back 20 years ago that was pushing for the establishment of a of an ECI. And I think if we connect a World Citizens Initiative closer to a topic that needs uh, urgent response, like the climate crisis, I think that's could be a good first step to uh, to really pushing for and building a campaign for a World Citizens Initiative. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Daniela. Um, moving on, uh, we're going to speak to John Stever now, and he's going to be taking us through transnationality in action. So what's actually happened now at the global level? Where are we sitting? So in 2021, the course simply brought together about 100 people around the world. And this is a snapshot of the world's 
the world's population. And this was a deliberate, deliberative democracy exercise. The participants and the citizens of the assemblies learned about and discussed climate and ecological crises and presented proposals, proposals at COP26. Um, this is a climate conference in November 2021. John is a co-founder and managing director of Innovation of Policy Foundation and co-founder of Impact Hub Kigali, among other initiatives. John co-initiated and co and coordinated the 2021 Global Assembly on Global Climate. We're going to hear from John now um, about that um, initiative, and he's going to tell us a bit more. Thank you, Londeka, and hi, everyone. It's great to be with you to share a little bit about uh, this question. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to build a little bit on the introduction from Caroline about what is transnationality um, and to recognize that, of course, the modern nation state as an idiosyncratic concept does trace its origins to Europe. The kind of modern global order, if you argue, could trace its origins to, uh, for example, Westphalia or largely to sort of European initiation. Um, but I also want to recognize that in the pre-colonial period, Uganda, for example, had more than 70, you could argue, nations, indivi individual sort of linguistic communities that were self-organized before colonization. In neighboring Rwanda, where I've lived for the last 15 and a half years, um, the colonial boundaries are actually smaller than the pre-colonial nation state of, of uh, Rwanda Urundi. Um, and so I, I want to kind of recognize that this idea of like a, of a nation or a group of people arguably could, as a sort of social technology, could trace its roots back about 11,000 years ago to the Neolithic Revolution. Around the time when humanity started being able to produce agriculture, they started being able to we started being able to, our collective ancestors started being able to actually co-locate in larger numbers. And in the process of co-locating in larger numbers, they had to create sort of forms of social technologies that would enable people to live together in groups larger than sort of hunter-gatherer communities. They, you know, we created religions, we created music, we created customs, weddings, all of the things that kind of have evolved into the modern nation state around flags and national anthems and sports like football that knit us together at a nation national level at a community level but also of course at a often at a global level every four years um and so just wanted to kind of share this idea of the sort of social technology that's evolved and recognizing that this idea of sort of independent communities that coexist side by side is something that traces its, its roots back of course eleven thousand years but it's also important to recognize that it's really difficult to sort of address these these issues that, that don't have borders, which Caroline really um, very well articulated that, you know, things like climate change, like pandemics, et cetera, don't, don't care where you are around the world. And we have sort of a collective action, action crisis when we sort of come together as, as independent sort of self-interested nation states or communities of people. And so uh, it's for that reason that at the with the community of the global assembly we started reimagining what could sort of planetary governance look like if we think about how humans could come together at an individual level to be able to articulate a common position on, on, on a subject um, and so i'm just going to share my screen and offer offer a little presentation for you let's see if i can are you able to see that Yes. All right. Perfect. All right. Transnational what in action. So I'm going to talk about the Global Citizens Assembly on Climate. Um, and before I do that, again, I'll just zoom out a little bit um, and talk a little bit about the emergence of citizens assemblies in general within the context of what's been referred to as the deliberative wave. And so in the in the blue, you see sort of democratic innovations. And just to just to say that this this is a database from the OECD. So it focuses on kind of OECD countries. Um, so it's not a globally representative, but it's kind of indicative um, data set to show kind of how citizens assemblies have emerged. And then within this area of democratic innovation, sort of transnational democratic innovations or innovations that sort of democratic forums that take place between two nation states um, is, is very, very new emerging uh, phenomenon. So the OECD database traces the first uh, transnational democratic innovation to around 2007. Um, 
And so then what is a transnational citizens assembly? So um, we could argue that a, you know, like a normal citizens assembly is a body of citizens who come together, deliberate. It's often considered to be the most kind of robust or elaborate model of representative deliberative uh, democracy. Some characteristics, generally citizens assemblies bring together um, the, the membership through a process called sortition or lottery selection. It means that the participants, there's an intention for those participants to represent the wider population. And you often do this through a two-step sort random selection process where you bring together a randomized pool of the population. In, in Europe, you might be able to use sort of national voter registry or social security type uh, identifications um, to be able to pull together a random pool of, of uh, citizens. And then what you'll do is you'll apply a second random selection with algorithms to ensure that the final selection matches certain demographic characteristics of the underlying population. I'll talk a little bit more about that when I go into what we did with the Global Assembly. Um, so a couple of common phases, generally citizens assemblies have a learning phase where the members of the assembly will learn about a particular issue. They'll be exposed to evidence, witness testimonies. Um, they'll often uh, have the opportunity to interrogate sort of experts and ask questions about um, the topics at hand. And then the second phase of a, of a transnational or of a citizens assembly is a, a dialogue or a deliberative process where they then members will sit often in small groups and discuss together. They'll weigh arguments. They'll extend their knowledge about the topic together. And then finally, there's a decision-making component where the members of the assembly will often surface proposals or develop recommendations together. Third characteristic of a, of a citizen's assembly is that facilitation is often provided independently of the convening and organizing bodies. And then finally, there's really an effort to make sure that this learning phase is kind of um, supported by what is considered to be a balanced set of information materials factual set of information materials, but balances different perspectives and worldviews about the about the issues. Um, when we talk about transnationality, we're talking about people from two plus nations participating. And then finally, um, you know, we we're, we're sort of in the data that I provided above, we're kind of bringing together a bunch of different definitions, but I'm going to go in and talk to you more about the Global Citizens Assembly that we organized in, in a moment. Um, so there's an increasing recognition because of everything that Caroline mentioned earlier that transnational issues require transnational democratic solutions. So uh, in the recent IPCC report, for example, um, they highlighted for the very first time that inclusive governance leads to more effective and sustainable adaptation outcomes. They also uh, recognize that um, sort of multi-stakeholder co-learning platforms, transboundary collaborations, community-based adaptation and participation scenarios, uh, et cetera, um, are, are like key to uh, adaptation to the climate and ecological crisis. Uh, and I wanted to highlight that because it's really important to recognize that even scientists that are concerned with the ecological crisis are recognizing that multi-stakeholder approaches are critical to addressing the climate crisis. Um, so the global assembly itself, our mission was to give everyone a seat at the global governance table. Going back to this point of our ancestors 11,000 years ago, you know, how do we reimagine what social technologies uh, we use as humanity to be able to address planetary um, crises that affect all of us? And so what we wanted to do is bring together um, a snapshot of humanity as individuals into a global decision making body. And um, what we did was we, we organized a four step process. I mentioned earlier that citizens assemblies often have a sort of sortition selection, which is what political scientists call like a lottery selection process for identifying the members of the assembly. Uh, in order to do that at a global level, of course, we don't have a global database of humans. We don't have a global database of social security, of voter registry. There's no sort of consistent way in which um, our sort of national identity is, is, is indicated. And of course, there are many people who, who don't necessarily belong to a particular nation state as a result of war, dislocation, et cetera. And so what we wanted to do was provide an opportunity for anyone, any human, to have an equal opportunity of being selected. And so we started out with a... Uh, um, a selection, a random selection of geographies. So we took a NASA database that maps population density on a 2D model of planet Earth. And then what we did was we randomly selected individual humans out of that database of 7.8 billion people. And then we identified which administrative region in the world they came from. 
and then we offset a random point in that location. So essentially what this process did was ensure that we picked random geographic locations that were weighted based on population distribution across Earth. And so um, in, the, in the process of this, we also built some algorithms to ensure that no modern nation state was overrepresented. So for example, the United States has about four and a half percent of global population. So we ensured that the algorithm of selection would pick no more than five geographic locations within the United States. So we rounded up to the nearest integer. We were working with 100 people. And so we wanted to make sure that no nation state was overly represented. Um, similarly, um, some of the larger nation states in the world, you see China and India here with about 17 points, um, respectively, um, have about 34% of the global population. So that's, that's a sort of a good distribution. You also see that smaller geographic locations uh, were also represented in this, in this selection. So you have this small point here in the Gulf of Aden is actually an island called Socotra, which is one of the most sort of geographically speaking, geologically speaking, rather isolated landforms on, on planet Earth. Um, and so we conducted a geographic distribution uh, first. Then we went and organized uh, and worked with local community organizations, deliberative democracy organizations all around the world. And we identified what we call cluster facilitators. So these are groups that were supporting uh, regions or languages um, to be able to coordinate these different distribution of points. So we had we had several groups that were based on language. So a sort of English speaking, Anglophone group, Portuguese speaking, um, Spanish, French, Arabic. We also had uh, clusters in China and India specifically because of the number of points, because of their idiosyncrasies. And then we also had a group of kind of 30 odd additional points that didn't fit well into any particular linguistic community or sort of ge geographic community that wasn't sort of relying on imperial or colonial histories. We So we took basically three groups of clusters, points, and we allocated them based on longitudinal um, sort of areas of the world. So longitude zero to 40 east, for example, was cluster one. Longitude 40 to 90 east was cluster two. Longitude 90 plus. The idea of bringing together people in a way that didn't sort of reinforce colonial imperial histories, but to be able to support a co-location of, of local actors within each of these regions. These cluster facilitators then organized a community of practice in each of their regions that then went around and identified essentially a local community organization in each of these 100 locations. And then these community organizations were trained to do on-street recruitment. They were literally walking around asking people in the street, would you like to participate in Global Citizens Assembly? They were knocking on people's doors, asking if they would like to join a Global Citizens Assembly. Um, we were offering members of the assembly a, a stipend of about US $600. And it's important to note that this $600 stipend was actually offered everyone in the world nominally the same amount, irrespective of where people came from. We wanted to value people's time nominally, not based on sort of an index of, of living standards, for example, but to nominally value everyone's time in this assembly as equivalent members the same. Um, so people on the street that were approached were offered $600 US to participate in a global citizens assembly that would be taking place for COP26. We ended up recruiting about 700 potential participants. So this was the, the first step of the two-step random selection I mentioned before. The second step was then to organize a sort of algorithm that would match the 100 people selected with the demographic characteristics of humanity according to four additional demographic characteristics. So gender, age, years in education, was, which is a proxy for socioeconomic status. Their concern about the climate crisis, because they were deliberating about the climate crisis, we wanted to make sure they weren't considered biased. We had a data from a UNDP data set of about one and a half million people from 50 countries, which said that 64% of humanity believed that, we, that the climate was in an emergency. Um, we might uh, anticipate that those numbers are higher based on recent sort of environmental issues and increasing recognition that they're caused by uh, climatic changes. Um, but that was the case in around 2020 when the survey was done and when we were starting this process. 
Um, and then, of course, we embedded a geographic distribution um, into the process through the ge geographic distribution in the initial step. So we made sure that we had one person from each of the 100 randomly selected locations and that they matched the demographic characteristics of humanity. And I think this is important to just pause and share this with you for a moment, that the column on the left is the demographic characteristics of humanity in, in these regards. The column in the middle are the respondents. And this is what you often see when you look at, like, for example, the direct democracy process or, or an open for all activity where the most interested people will show up. The reality is that the most interested people are often the people that are most more concerned than average about a particular issue. But importantly, they're also far more educated than the average. And of course, education is highly correlated with wealth. And so you often end up having the most educated, the most wealthy, the most connected members of a community, as well as the people that are most concerned about an issue that show up for an open for all event. And so by controlling for this demographic characteristics, the final set of assembly members on the right actually matches more the demographic characteristics of humanity. So we were able to make sure that the number of assembly members, for example, that were concerned about the crisis, climate crisis, that they were deliberating about match that of humanity. We were able to moderate somewhat the overrepresentation of people in higher education, for instance, et cetera. Um, it's important to note that the assembly members came from 49 different countries. They spoke 42 different languages. More than a third had never been on a video call before. So what we're doing now, they'd never done before. They'd never even been on a smartphone speaking to somebody on the other side of a screen. More than 11 of the assembly members were fully illiterate. And so um, what you're looking at is essentially demographic characteristics that much closer represent the average of humanity. And so what we did was we supported each of those assembly members to learn about the climate crisis. We created an information booklet with a knowledge and wisdom committee that was composed of scientists. For example, it was chaired by Sir Bob Watson, who's chaired both the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as well as the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And so it was chaired by this uh, scientist. We also had indigenous wisdom keepers joining this. We had petroleum scientists um, joining this, and really a mixture of perspectives from around the world to be able to co-create an information booklet for people about the climate crisis. We then supported this information booklet to be contextualized and localized. So we organized with each of the community organizations, local community contextualization events, where the information booklet was translated, but also localized. So bringing in local examples, et cetera. Then we supported each assembly member through the community host to provide internet connection, a device, to provide um, someone who could support the use of the device for people who, who, who aren't used to using computers and aren't used to being on video calls. And then importantly, every single member of the assembly had a translator companion uh, who was able to translate the conversations so that it was understandable. Um, and this is a this is a picture of one of the assembly members, Cham Chayabat in Thailand, being supported by a translator as well as a, as a device in the kind of setup that he was able to have access to um, in Thailand. And I also just want to acknowledge and celebrate the work that Caroline did actually organizing the community um, in Germany and actually not only randomly selecting a, a participant from Germany to participate in the global assembly based on the randomly selected point that was that was that landed nearby, um, but also providing facilitation and uh, translation support for the assembly member from, from Germany. Um, so some other things that we did to be able to make this more inclusive, we developed hand signals. People were tr like communicating through translators. So we developed a set of hand signals that we checked uh, to see if they were sort of um, kind of culturally appropriate for people all around the world. We realized, for example, that holding up your hand is considered rude in quite a few cultures. So we created a new hand signal uh, where you put one hand inside of the other to indicate that you have something in your hand. And we tried to develop these hand signals in such a way that they actually reinforced good deliberative practice. Because of course, the bulk of the citizens assembly was intended to provide an opportunity for these citizens from all around the world to discuss the climate crisis together. We wanted this to be a respectful conversation, to elevate the unforced force of the better argument, as Jürgen Habermas would say, or to contribute to the collective consciousness, as the physicist David Bohm would say. And so we put this hand signal, for instance, if I have something to offer, as the sort of indicator that an assembly member wanted to share something. 
And the idea is that this wanting to say something was actually framed as wanting to contribute to the dialogue, wanting to offer an alternative perspective, and recognizing that the contribution to the group discourse was actually in service of the group's collective consciousness. Um, in addition to that, I'll just highlight really quickly the co-creation approach, because of course, how do people from 49 countries coming together on a Zoom call with their translators actually develop something together? Uh, we created a multi-step co-creation process where essentially the, the members were working in 20 breakout groups of five. They surfaced ideas in these 20 breakout groups. And then we had a group of independent editors, an emphasis here on independent editors, because we didn't want, as the organizers or the facilitation team, which was also being organized as independently as possible, to have influence over the outcome. And so we had a group of independent editors take those inputs from the 20 breakout groups, edit those inputs into a single document. Then they brought that document back to the assembly members, and we surfaced another 20 um, rounds of comments. We then converge this into another final document, an, a third round of convergence and review and, and, and comments. And then at that point, after three rounds of sort of collective development across breakout groups with the support of independent editors, the, the uh, proposals were then sent to a vote. Um, in this vote, assembly members were actually voting item by item on the elements of the, on the proposals that they created um, to ensure that there weren't any sort of in a way, free riders is what you would call it in the sort of electoral representative legislature where a legislator sort of throws in something into a bigger bill to kind of get passed because people agree with 90%. We wanted people to really uh, like respond to um, and, and sort of assert their, um, you know, comments and, and views on each of the different elements of the um, what they created, which they chose to call the People's Declaration for the Sustainable Future of Planet Earth, uh, which is a name that they came up with themselves. Um, and uh, this People's Declaration for the Sustainable Future of Planet Earth was presented at COP26 in Glasgow um, and in November 2021, on stage actually with the First Minister of Scotland, who was hosting, as well as the climate activist Vanessa Nakate uh, and others. Um, and has since been used um, as an advocacy document by members of the global community. All right, so that is um, an overview of a very complex process in a very short amount of time. I hope that um, that provides you all with, the, with a good introduction and overview of what Citizens Assemblies uh, can be in practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. There was so much work put into that project and honestly the outcomes are amazing and the reach that you guys were able to people the amount of people you were able to reach is amazing i just want to jump right into the questions right now um i would like to open this up that we can you can unmute yourself if you'd like to, well we will unmute you from our side if you have a question um maybe if we could start with the question that's in the chat um dario if you would like to say it out yourself and this question is directed to daniela um, if we could just, um, but if you don't feel comfortable speaking, please just leave your questions in the chat and I will read them out and maybe just say which speaker you're directing your questions to. Okay, maybe I just read out the first question for now and it's for you, Daniela. Are there any proposals for a real direct democracy tool at European Union level? Yeah, um, I answered maybe some people that can't can see the chat, but there um, there are some proposals, of course, I mean, there is good and wide support across um, democracy, civil society organizations for advancing the European citizens initiative really evolving it to become a, um, a real right of uh, also initiative for 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 citizens that could trigger EU wide referendum. And uh, there's also proposals then from uh, political actors, like there's a, a, there's different reports in the European Parliament committees and the, the AFCO, the Constitutional Affairs Committee, uh, that also support this. Uh, and then proposals from the big conference on the future of Europe, uh, which is the, which was our smaller version of the, the Global Assembly was also a, using citizens assemblies and, and uh, random selection sortition uh, at EU level for the very first time in, in history. Uh, and from there, a proposal also came out 
out that would uh, strengthen the ECI and also introduce EU-wide referendum. The question just always comes down to uh, who would trigger the EU-wide referendum. So of course, uh, the, in the in the proposals of the Conference on the Future of Europe, it says that it should be triggered by the European Parliament in rare cases. Of course, our vision of that and view of that is, is, is different. We want citizens uh, to be able to trigger that. We want that to be bottom up. Yeah, thanks, Daniela. Um, please, can you use the raise hand function if you'd like to ask a question? And we'll just go through the questions that the floor has. Are there any questions? No? Wow, I didn't think we would be able to explain everything. <laughs> yeah, me neither. Um, Maybe we can give Dario an opportunity since he was interested in asking a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you are muted, uh, Dario. No, not Dario. Oh, DDA. Yes, uh, it's okay that I speak now? Yes, please. Okay, uh, just, uh, um, it is really uh, very interesting uh, uh, about the last uh, project. So I didn't know about this, uh, uh, once again, uh, great. Who was uh, paying for this? <laughs> How was it? Uh, may maybe you said it at the beginning and I missed it, but uh, yeah, I suppose it was very expensive. So who was paying for this? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for <laughs> thank you, thank you, Landeka. Thank you, Didier, for the question. Um, so yes, the the overall cost of the Global Citizens Assembly was about US one million dollars, and so just to say that it it would have cost much more, um, and the project really did rely on on uh, global solidarity. A lot of organizations contributed an exceptional amount of of work over and beyond what any sort of financial compensation would have been able to, to cover. Um, and there were about 400 individuals and organizations in more than 100 countries that contributed to making the Global Assembly happen. Uh, the, the $1 million uh, was a mix. There was an initial sort of crowdfunding campaign that did bring in um, some smaller resources to be able to get started. Um, but in addition to that, we received 100,000 pounds from the Scottish government. And then the rest of the funding uh, was received uh, from primarily uh, philanthropic organizations, foundations um, in the global north. Um, so groups like the Climate Emergency Collaboration Group, which is a, a consortium of many funders like Ford Foundation, Oak, CIF, et cetera. Um, there's um, some funding was received from the European Climate Foundation and, and other, other philanthropic organizations, if that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. We also have another question from Itza from the chat. Um, Itza, I'll, I'll read this one out because um, I take it you don't really want to. Um, okay, I see you, Sam. Um, Itza says, how many people were involved in the core organization of the Global Citizen Assembly? So this one is for you again, John, you're very famous. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, um, Itza, for the question. And yeah, I mean, I, I also, it's, it's the, the curse of the panel discussion. I think the last person um, has the most memorable presentation. <laughs> um, as you've all sat through about an hour of, of discussion first. So, um, but I'll, I'll answer all the questions that come happily. Um, and also maybe I'll just also add, um, this speaks a bit to Didier's question about the funding and transparency. We One of our values of the Global Citizens Assembly was openness because we wanted people to be able to learn from the exercise. We the, the really the main objective beyond giving everyone a voice at the global governance table, particularly around climate, was sort of offering an opportunity to learn and kind of experiment and explore and innovate in, in, a, in a sort of framework of solidarity globally, what global governance and planetary governance could look like, for example, if we were to reimagine it completely. And um, we published more than 850 pages on our website. So if you go to globalassembly.org, we have... Um, we have an executive summary, a short summary of what we did. We have a 
more than 300 page reports. Uh, we also have published everything from contracts to facilitation plans. So you can literally see absolutely everything and there's full transparency on the funding and, and everything else for the project. Um, in terms of who was involved in the core organization, we also have a full roster of all of the different teams. We use something that is often called, well, we modified something often called holacracy or sociocracy. It's essentially a, a form of decentralized autonomous organization. It's often used by social movements um, in the last years, like Extinction Rebellion, for example. And the idea is to create a series of groups that are able to focus on a particular topic. They have a mandate to work on, for example, communications or fundraising, and they have autonomy within that circle to be able to take decisions, and they communicate to each other through anchor circle meetings and through other linkages and liaisons. And so we're able to use that approach to really um, radically decentralize the, the organization of the Global Assembly, of course, within the constraints of organizing such a complex project on short time horizon. And this is how we were able to bring on more than 400 organizations in over and in people in, in over 100 countries to be a part of building this. Um, and just to say that in terms of the core anchor circle, um, our organization, Innovation for Policy Foundation, coordinated um, the anchor circle, designed the, the organizational structure in the, the, the global assembly. Um, and we were joined by two other organizations, one that is now called ISWI, uh, which is a British organization, and another organization called Deliberativa. Um, and our organization, I for Policy, is sort of pan-African organization. I was joined by two colleagues. Um, so there are about 10 people in that anchor circle that then filtered out into the other um, sections, uh, teams of the global assembly to, to coordinate um, the overall action. Yeah, please can we split Siri, um, unmute Siri for his question? Um, yes, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the great presentation for all the speaker. Um, I I have three, uh, a question regarding to the uh, what is lunch petitions at uh, trans national because right now I'm uh, I'm I'm landing a petition to uh, to stop human rights abuse and uh, yeah restore democracy and make peace in Cambodia. So uh, could you please uh, tell me who can I contact or send this petition to be effective to take the action in EU and uh, I would like to get some help more like uh, to do uh, this petition like to get more support so so who can I uh, yeah uh, ask for help yeah thank you um Daniela maybe you can answer this one for us yeah, um, we need, of course, uh, political support and government support where we can. So um, if we can get uh, support of UN member states, that's, of course, uh, ideal. So um, I can also put a link in the in the chat. Uh, any NGOs you're also working with or connected with, we're also coll collecting, of course, um, CSO support. But we also had um, like letters and invitations you could send to your Ministry of Foreign Affairs that they could also support this such an idea. So I can put the I can put the link to the uh, to the campaign in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. I'm going to go to the chat now. We have a question from Sebastian, and it's for all the speakers. But maybe Caroline, you can take this one. For all the speakers, what are the main challenges for citizen participation and deliberative processes? Yeah, um, that they don't exist, or that they that they don't exist everywhere where they should exist, um, and of course, I mean, I think when we speak about deliberative processes and and participation and direct democracy, um, we always say the the first um, precondition is having a democratic system to begin with, right? Um, so the the backsliding of democracy around the world, and and like for the first time since um, since the fall of the of the Soviet Union, basically, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, we're actually seeing um, the number of democracies lowering again. So we've, we've had 30 years where um, each year we'd have new democracies and, and, and people um, introducing more new democratic systems and, um, and, and they, were, they weren't always perfect, but, but for the first time in, in like 30 years, we're seeing um, that we're having less and less democracies around the world. 
So without that to begin with, um, I, there is just no possibility for participation or deliberation, right? Because you need free press. You need to be able to um, to be able to exercise your freedom of speech without fear of retribution. You need to have access to good courts. Um, you need to have good good representation to begin with. So if you don't have those things, like we can forget about um, participation. Um, and and then the second thing I would say is, is like then often what we see is when when new tools are introduced like this, um, with the first like sort of we we throw out the child with the bathwater like we throw out the first pancake and the whole the whole thing goes right, um, like it's people also need time to learn how new tools work, so so you can't expect people to to you know to to have a, a citizens assembly be introduced or to have a citizens initiative right be introduced and to for that all of the population immediately knows exactly how this tool will serve them and how they will be able to use it so you also need time to learn democracy and then um and to make mistakes in that sense um but in the end it's, it's also what what john said right like in, inclusive government governance is more sustainable meaning that like if people are able to make their own decisions for themselves, they're also more likely to support them and to to help implement them. And and in the end, it's all about res making people responsible for their, like, or accountable and responsible and and able to shape their own futures. Yeah, um, we're running out of time a little bit, but we'll take this um, one for Daniela. So it's, do you know if the EU is planning any campaign to raise awareness of the ECI? It seems to be a good tool, not too, not so risky for the EU governments, um, as it is not binding, and yet so many citizens, not so many citizens know about it. Yeah, yeah, there's already, it's been in the works, so it's already been a years long uh, campaign, but of course it moves slow. Um, it's called the EU, EU Take the Initiative, so like you take the initiative, nice play on, on words the, <laughs> the EU always has. Uh, and there's a different, I mean, variety of like communication materials that's there, I can also link it um, here in the chat. Uh, there's an ECI uh, ambassador program. I'm an ECI ambassador, so we're basically like multipliers for the ECI. And we go to different uh, events, especially at local levels, like different festivals uh, to speak about the ECI. Uh, and there's a whole calendar of, of also, we're trying to really reach people uh, on the ground. So there is already a communications campaign in the works, but I think this could be done a lot better. For example, in um, connecting it with already existing like Europe Day or um, or connecting ECIs with a with a citizens assemblies, uh, the citizens panels we have at the EU, really popular and, and um, tool right now that that uh, deliberative democracy organizations are are pushing for. So I think connecting ECIs and really building this democratic ecosystem, I think that's really going to be the key if we're going to to push the the awareness. And in the end, I mean, as I always say, we can. Uh, we cannot just throw the money at the at the issue with the low public awareness. I mean, all the all the funding in the world is not going to just help raise awareness for the ECI. In the end, the tool needs to sell itself. So we need strong political responses to ECIs because that's what's going to get uh, really the interest of then the media and then interest of, of people. Yeah, thank you. And can we please just unmute Didier as a final question? I see you have a couple of questions that have been coming in. Maybe if you would speak and we can just hear which question exactly you'd like to be answered. Yes, uh, thank you, actually. Um, um, first, uh, I have I have only one one question, but it's maybe uh, outside of the scope. Uh, well, it's certainly a bit of outside of the scope, but still, uh, uh, do you know about the uh, the initiative concerning a project of um, uh, Parliament of the United Nations? And uh, uh, what do you think about this project? I know it is not about direct de democracy, but it is about uh, global democracy. And uh, yeah, and maybe I have one more uh, last question that I didn't uh, write, but um, are you also thinking about kind of um, world referendum, but uh, um, uh, in an electronic way or, or not at all? But I will, I will take a look at your uh, websites after 
uh, anyway, very interesting. Thank you. Sure, Caroline, I definitely think this one is for you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so so we we are aware of the campaign for uh, UN Parliamentary Assembly, and and we actually work together with it. So, the World Citizens Initiative, which Daniela proposed, and the uh, par UN Parliamentary Assembly are both part of a campaign um, that Democracy International is is running together with um, an as an, an org. Well, Sorry, a group of a group of over it's late <laughs> together with a group of over two hundred civil society organizations uh, around the world, which includes Greenpeace and Abaz. Um, so we are calling for a more democratic UN, and one of the things that we are calling for is a parliamentary assembly. Um, and just for the people watching or or in this meeting who who don't really know what the difference would be between that and the general assembly, which which exists, right? Um, so the UN right now has the has a general assembly, which, as I mentioned, is made up of representatives of member states. Um, so they are these are political appointees, um, high level diplomats who are not um, not directly elected and only in the best case uh, appointed by a by a democratically elected government. But in many many cases, not <laughs> there there is no democratically elected government uh, to appoint them. Um, and so the idea of a uh, United Nations Parliamentary Assembly um, is basically, as in any parliamentary elections, that uh, people would be able to vote um, for somebody in their country who would represent them at the UN, um, like, it, like it happens, for example, in the European Union. Um, and so that's a, that's a very nice and simple and doable idea. Um, and that's definitely worth looking into. And I think the, the link is also in the chat. Um, and, and it's also something that we work towards. Um, the world referendum thing, I can I can quickly deal with that. Um, so like, yes, ideally, of course, for something global, we should be able to decide globally. The problem is that we don't have implementation infrastructure on the global level. So like who would be the government to that this referendum would be sent to? Who would implement um, these decisions? So. So even the UN, like the best that you can hope for is, is a resolution, right? Which is basically an agreement between member states. Um, so so I, I'm not aware of any campaigns that, that are working towards that. I'm also not sure it's at the moment something that is, that is possible or, or, or even desirable. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. So that ends off our question um, session. We're also just running a bit out of time. Um, but I think in closing that uh, we recognize that while direct democracy holds a promise and a means of empowering citizens and fostering inclusivity and implementing, um, and this is able to be implemented on a transnational scale, it presents like a whole lot of unique hurdles. The complexity of that diverse cultures, legal frameworks, and the, just the sheer magnitude of the issues that, um, that, that we face like on a global level, like from country to country. And while there may not be a one size fits all solution, our conversation I feel has revealed some inspiring examples of transnational initiatives that have um, been, have shown like um, good signs and things that we can work towards. And the models offer lessons and they, they demonstrate potential. Uh, which I think is what what is important, and I think for our, our three our three panelists, thank you so much for being here. But I think just in closing, maybe just a thirty seconds from each of you guys, uh, what do you think the future of transnational democratic processes look looks like? Okay, I uh, will start with Daniela because you're the first one on my screen. Okay, well, what I think about what I what I hope it looks like, I hope there's more political will. Uh, maybe this is also in a quick response to a, the question on the challenges, but um, I think all of the, the lobbying efforts that we did for the European Citizens Initiative, even if it had great civil society support, um, I think it would have been in vain if there wasn't uh, political will on the other end. So we do need to find the allies uh, on, on the political side uh, as well. So that's what I hope. And I think as also politicians are waking up, realizing they have to take decisions closer to, to the citizens, um, I, uh, I think we're gonna get in that direction too. Caroline? Yeah, I, I think it, it has to look more participatory and, and more direct and, and more democratic and more inclusive. 
Um, if we look at our transnational organizations that we have right now, they were built for a different time. They were built in a different era where it wasn't possible for people to decide directly. Uh, a lot of people, not everybody, I, I'm willing to admit, but more people than ever have access to the internet, have, have smartphones, have possibilities um, to, to vote for, like to, to, to share their opinions on things instantly. Um, so th there's really no reason to have these um, filter upon a filter upon a filter upon a filter um, for, for people at the global level. Um, so, so I think we're, we're at, a, at a natural sort of evolution point where, where we, we have to make a decision to move forward and to build something better. Um, and just um, as, a, as a sort of closing thing on that, the UN is currently in a, in a reform process. So um, at the end of next year in September, um, during the, gen the general um, assembly week, there will be the summit of the future um, where they will discuss many different things, but they will also discuss how to upgrade the UN. So we're living through a historic, a historic moment right now. Yeah, definitely. And last but not least, over to you, John. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I just want to build on what Caroline said. You know, it's been more than 75 years since the UN was founded. Um, and we have we have this historic opportunity coming up. So I think it's really important for everyone on this call, if you're not a member of the We the People's campaign, then join it. Um, start reimagining what new democratic futures look like for humanity. Um, I shared this chart earlier, right? This bar chart that was like, going up about democratic innovations. And you saw like a couple of spattering of transnational democratic innovations in there. Um, I think we're about to experience really a renaissance and like a kind of explosion of innovation in the transnational space. The um, following the Global Citizens Assembly, there was a group that had attempted to organize a, a global assembly on genome editing a few years ago. Um, but in the next years, we can imagine a Global Citizens Assembly on things like artificial intelligence, on oceans. Those are two proposals that are currently existing from very strong organizations and consortiums of partners. Um, but what I, what I really hope is that we just continue having more innovation in this space. Um, that that we we don't know what the answers are. There's a really strong kind of urge for citizens' assemblies, of course, for random selection, for equitable participation, but there's also an opportunity for other forms of democratic participation, you know, World Citizens Initiative, where you're you're surfacing proposals from humanity to be to be discussed and debated, perhaps by a global citizens assembly or by a parliament, and the kind of integration and communication between these. And, and I don't want to sound sort of antagonistic to the modern nation state, but I, I do think it's important to recognize that our current governance architecture is to blame for all of our global challenges, whether that's wars that we see, um, whether that's sort of inability to deal with pandemics in an effective way, whether that's an in inability to deal with more than three decades of scientific information and evidence that we're running off of a cliff with our environment. Um, our, our governance institutions are just not fit for purpose anymore. We live in a global world. We can communicate globally. We can um, move globally. We trade goods globally. What happens on one side of the world affects people on the other in ways that we're all intimately aware now as a result of the pandemic. And so uh, I think the question isn't, you know, whether this should happen. I think it must uh, if we're going to have a better sort of future for humanity. And so I really encourage everyone in this call again to join the We the People's Movement. Uh, and I say that as someone who will ourself will join as Innovation for Policy Foundation, we're obviously partnered and collaborating with Democracy International and people, but we, we haven't formally joined yet. And I, I'm going to take my own advice, practicing what I preach to you all and join. Um, but I really encourage you all to join that movement, to form your own initiatives, uh, to join other initiatives and really push for a more positive democratic future, because it really will take we the people in order to build a we the people based global uh, planetary governance. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, John. I, I really think that there's no better time than now for like democratic reform on, on the transnational level. And this is definitely our chance. And I think we should all grab it with both hands and make the most of it. I would like to extend a huge thank you to our panelists for their expertise and their thought provoking contributions, as well as to the participants for their engagements and their valuable perspectives. Together, we can strive for inclusion, transparency, and effective decision making processes that truly reflect reflect the voices and the aspirations of all citizens across all borders. 
Um, this, so this is the end of this webinar and we have our last webinar in this series coming up in two weeks. So please join that. The topic is why direct democracy doesn't work. Um, come to find out more. Um, this will be in, in two weeks. And thank you so much for everybody for joining again to our panelists, uh, John, Daniela, Caroline. Thank you. And thank you to all the participants. Goodbye. Good work. Offline, right? Yeah. <laughs> Are we? Yeah, um, I think I just stopped I the. Oh, I haven't stopped the recording actually. <laughs> <laughs>